My name is Nicholas Danforth, and you're listening to the War on the Rocks podcast, covering strategy, defense, and foreign affairs. We're here today to talk about Iran, and we have a lot more to talk about than we expected when we scheduled this. So I'm delighted to be joined by three of Washington's leading experts on this subject. We have, in alphabetical order, Eric Brewer, Deputy Vice President for the Nuclear Threat Initiative's Nuclear Materials Security Program, and he previously served as the Director for Counterproliferation at the National Security Council. We're also joined today by Dana Stroll, Director of Research and Shelley and Michael Casson, Senior Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. From 2021 to 2023, she served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Defense for the Middle East. Finally, we're joined by Commander Gavin Clough, the 2023-2024 Senior U.S. Navy Fellow at the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. He's also a U.S. Navy Foreign Area Officer and previously served as a Surface Warfare Officer for 10 years, uh, at which point your Atlantic Council bio says you were circumnavigating the globe, <laughs> which is not a phrase we that was. get to use often enough. Thank you all for joining us today. Pleasure to be with you. Thanks. Great being here. Let me start by asking you over the last couple of weeks, as we've seen all sorts of activity in the Middle East, what has surprised you most? Maybe I'll take that first since I was doing this on a daily basis in the Pentagon until last year. One development that I've been thinking about a lot is that essentially in less than a year, we've seen two black swan events that have challenged the assumptions about how U.S. policy makers were thinking about the Middle East. The first is the Hamas attack on October 7th. Our assumptions about Hamas behavior, Iranian support to Hamas, were based on a premise that Hamas was more interested in maintaining its governance position in Gaza and making sure that something flowed to the civilians of Gaza rather than perpetrating a terrorist attack of such brutality that Israel would have to respond. And then number two is we have for a long time now based our responses in the Middle East on the assumption that Iran would invest in asymmetric warfare, arming, training, equipping, and directing proxies in Lebanon, Yemen, Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere to maintain pressure on Israel. And what we just saw on April 13th was an Iranian senior leader's decision to launch a state-on-state -state attack, which is something we have not seen before. Yeah, maybe I can jump in from the nuclear side of things. I mean, I don't want to fight the scenario here, but I, I, mean, I think on the nuclear side, there hasn't been too much that I've been surprised with so far in, in the context of the regional conflict and crisis. I guess I would say, though, you know, maybe that's going to change here soon, because I think what we're seeing now is, you know, since the, the outset of, of the crisis, I think Iran's nuclear program has kind of loomed in the background, right? But I think perhaps since April 1st, that's changing a bit. You know, we've seen uh, some Iranian officials uh, make some comments about uh, Iran's capability to build nuclear weapons. An IRGC official uh, came out and specifically said that if Israel threatens Iran's nuclear facilities and strikes Iran's nuclear facilities, that Iran might revise its doctrine uh, of, you know, having a hedging strategy and, in effect, threatening to build nuclear weapons. And then hours later, Israel responds by striking air defense equipment intended to protect a nuclear site, right, sending what I would argue is a, a deliberate signal. So, you know, perhaps the nuclear issue in Iran's nuclear program is, is moving a little bit to the, the, the fore of this conflict. Would propose that while October 7th was a great surprise to us and was unexpected, I think what we've seen over the course of the last few years is a lead up to a state on state attack by Israel as they've tested resolve and response from harassing U.S. forces in Syria and Iraq uh, to the Houthis, a uh, new campaign against maritime shipping in the Red Sea. I think all of those steps uh, were, were sort of a testing the waters from, from Tehran's standpoint to the point where they felt more confident in launching an attack of the scale they did against Israel on the 13th, rather confident that a U.S. response would not, a direct U.S. response was, was not, uh, was a low risk. So let me get back to what you were saying then, Dana, and follow up on this. It, what do you think prompted Iran to cross that threshold to go from asymmetric to a direct attack on Israel? Do you think it was their confidence the U.S. wouldn't respond? Do you think there were other factors at play? Well, President Biden did not specify what 
a response would be, nor did he make it clear that an Iranian state-on-state attack would result in a direct U.S. response. What he did was increase defense posture in the region, direct the State Department and his national security team to do an extensive round of both public and private diplomacy, and his one word to Tehran was don't. They tested the premise. Two things happened that I think are noteworthy here. The first is the United States demonstrated what I think is our competitive advantage in the Middle East, which is that there is no other military that could design an integrated air and missile defense response, which is what you saw on April 13th. It was it was the United States that organized partners in the region, European allies, as well as Israel, all together to engage and intercept those drones cruise missiles, uh, and ballistic missiles. And then the United States clearly did work with the Israelis. And within this existing and rising coalition, it was quite clear that a full conventional regional war is not in anyone's interest. And I think, frankly, there are some resource implications there for the IDF, given their commitments in Gaza. And so what we saw, I completely agree with Eric. This was a shot across the bow. It was an off-ramp to de-escalation should Iranian supreme leaders decide that they don't want to respond. But the message can't be any more clear. Your air defenses are penetrable. We can reach deep inside Iran, not just what you're doing on the coast. We know where your nuclear facilities are, and they can be reached should we make the strategic decision to do that. So as much as this was a surprise, as much as this was crossing a threshold, you don't think it necessarily portends further conflict in this direction? I think we're in a new phase. This We should be talking now about the post-April 13th strategic context. Iran has launched a state attack on Israel. Israel, although it didn't claim publicly responsibility, everyone assesses that it was Israel, launched a state attack on Iran. Both have decided at this moment in time to not have another cycle now. But we have crossed a new threshold in terms of what conflict looks like in the Middle East. The risk of miscalculation is always there. And also now both both leaderships of the two countries are testing the waters. We're, we're in a new phase. I think part of this new phase as well is... is coming to terms with with Iran's perspective that they have successfully deterred the United States um, in, in, in interfering with their own national objectives. And so taking the, the kind of the knowing thy enemy sort of outlook, you have to, I think, understand that military advisors in Iran are likely saying we have successfully deterred the United States from interfering in our regional uh, interests. The only other aspect of this that I think is really important to consider at this moment in time is that as many policymakers in many capitals, not only in Washington, considered the possibilities of military responses inside Iran, a lot of the concern was always what the Iranian response looked like. And we all knew that after the U.S. unilateral withdrawal from the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear agreement, the Iranians doubled down in expanding their one-way attra- attack drone arsenal, their cruise missile arsenal, their ballistic missile arsenal. So the thinking was that the scale, the severity, and the damage of that kind of attack was almost unthinkable. I mean, the Iranians should be deterred because their complex attack utterly failed. Most of it was successfully intercepted by a network of allies and partners working together, and the rest of it failed in launch. So they should be rethinking their own military options going forward. And in that space are opportunities for the United States, Israel, and others to work. Can I ask briefly on that note, was there anything specific about Iranian military capabilities that we learned in the course of these back and forth attacks? Well, we certainly learned that their air missile defense system needs some work or is in serious disarray, whether that's a command and control, a, an equipment maintenance issue, or just obsol- obsolescence. They utterly failed to defend a pretty critical military installation. So there's that. The defensive capabilities of Israel and the coalition uh, defending Israel prove their worth beyond uh, measure. And I think, like Dana was saying, you know, Iran really has to rethink what it is capable of doing 
with the arsenal that they have, given that terrible outcome that they that they that they uh, came to realize trying to hit Israel. One one thing I guess I as as I'm thinking about particularly their support to Russia now is, is what do they get from Russia in return for that support and what effect will that have on their capabilities moving forward, uh, whether that is falls into the nuclear realm or, or other capability realms. So here, if I were Iranian military leaders involved in executing that attack on April 13th, the first thing I would do is have an after action report with my friends in Moscow. I would figure out what have the Russians been doing that's been more successful in Ukraine? What can I learn about wh- the areas of weakness of my own response? And what do we, Russian leaders and Iranian leaders, do immediately to improve the lethality of the next round of attacks, either in the Middle East or in Ukraine? They're both battlefield laboratories. Something's working in Ukraine that didn't work in the Middle East. And we are seeing, of course, an emergence of an axis of adversaries, and they should be doing, I would, I would assume that they would be doing the same kind of review, lessons learned after action report that we should be doing with our partners to evaluate the success of our, of our defense on April 13th and where we go from there. You know, from the nuclear standpoint, right? I mean, I think everyone's looking at how this conflict can shape Iran's nuclear decisions, Right. This is the first conflict in the Middle East where Iran has had a threshold nuclear capability, right? And I think that's pretty important. You know, Iran can produce enough material for a bomb uh, within about two weeks from a decision to do so and multiple bombs worth shortly thereafter. And so, you know, I think a really important question is how does Iran view its nuclear, that nuclear capability in the context of this crisis? Does it view it as a, a card that it can leverage in this crisis, or does it view it as a target on its back? And I think the reality is probably neither of those ends of the spectrum. It's somewhere in between. In between. But I do think we've seen Iran try to leverage its nuclear program to, sh- to, to further its objectives in this conflict, right? We've seen Iran dial up at 60% uh, in, uh, in late November. In January, kind of dialed that back down. Uh, again, we've seen Iranian officials make statements that kind of allude to the fact that they've done a lot of the work involved on nuclear weapons and could, you know, if if circumstances dictate, could move forward. Uh, so I think they're trying to leverage it to further their goals. It's an open question of whether they've been successful in doing that. And I guess the, the final point I would make on this is I think the course of this conflict will shape Iran's nuclear strategy. It is either going to reinforce that strategy of, of staying short of a bomb and having the threshold capability, or it's going to change it. And it's going to cause Iran to decide that it needs to move further forward with this nuclear program. I, I would bet it's probably not going to cause Iran to like restrain it further and roll it further back, right? It's either going to stay or move forward. Um, and I think a big part of that, you know, what could cause it to go further forward, I think is kind of like actually the things that might otherwise be in our interest and Israel's interest, which are things like a severe degradation of the, uh, the axis of resistance, Um, where Iran feels like it's not in a a place where it can use that effectively. If Iran thinks that the other element of its deterrent, the conventional element uh, that Dana was speaking about earlier, if Iran thinks that that is not effective as a retaliatory capability or deterrent, wow. I mean, that's pretty significant, right? Because then you really, Iran's kind of isolated, right? So then where does it turn? And I think there's a risk that it turns the nuclear side of the equation. All right. Really glad you raised both those questions to the questions I was eager to ask you. It's almost like we talked about this beforehand. Uh, But as you point out, I mean, it is incredible that for 20 years, we've been talking about the risk of Iran becoming a nuclear power. We're now at a point where people are saying Iran is a nuclear threshold state. This has not gotten a huge amount of discussion. And so the two questions, as you said, I mean, A, how is this playing out in terms of specific decisions being made in the course of a conflict in Tehran, in Jerusalem, in Washington? And then how is this conflict shaping the way Iranian policymakers are going to move ahead with, you know, either an overt or covert, the nuclear program and the policy decisions they're going to make? So yeah, let me jump off from what you said, Eric, and open this up to anyone else, or if you have further thoughts. The way I think about this is really pre-April 13th and post-April 13th. So in terms of what what I think the supreme leader of Iran was, was likely quite comfortable before April 13th, a few data points on that. 
number one, you had seen the full activation of Iran's uh, proxy network, the, the terrorists and the non-state actors that it has supported and put decades of investments into in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, et cetera. In Yemen, the Houthis have largely successfully redirected international shipping around one of the world's, I'm sure Gavin's going to have something to say about that, but really demonstrated that a challenge to freedom of navigation and free flow of commerce. And, and the international shipping industry has, has responded to that. In Lebanon, Hezbollah has continued to maintain pressure uh, on northern Israel. Israelis in the north are not living in their homes anymore, um, although both sides appear to have not made a decision to, to escalate to full-scale conflict. And in Iraq and Syria, we saw these non-state actors launch more than 180 attacks on U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria. And then we know that there have been times where they have actually initiated attacks all the way from Iraq and Syria, all the way toward Israeli territory. And in that, the Iranians have actually coupled it with pretty effective propaganda which is all about defending Palestinians. And in that space where the Iranians have associated themselves with humanitarian issues and the need of civilian Palestinian civilians in Gaza, the Arab capitals have largely been silent. While they've maintained their peace treaties with Israel, they've maintained their agreements with the Abraham Accords. The Saudis have not taken normalization with Israel off the table. So it looked like the Iranians had the upper hand. And by all accounts, by from diplomats that I spoke to, who are based in Tehran, the Iranians were actually feeling quite good. The Israelis have also been, it's long been reported, prosecuting what they called a war between the wars. So targeting IRGC leaders who were up to no good in Syria. There was the shadow war between Iran and Israel that went from maritime areas to cyber issues, uh, as well as to trying to interdict the Iranian shipment of advanced conventional weapons going from Tehran through Baghdad to Damascus to Beirut, et cetera. When the Iranians chose to change their response, move out of the shadows into a direct confrontation, one, diplomatic focus shifted. It was no longer on Israel's campaign in Gaza. It's now on Iran and it being the center of gravity for destabilizing activities. Two, you saw this coalition emerge up, all willing to work together militarily to defend against the Iranian attack. And now you've seen renewed energy not only in U.S. sanctions, but real coordination with Europe on sanctions. The nuclear issue is one that hasn't been at the forefront since October 7th, but we all are starting to talk about it again. All of this is not, is not something that I think the Supreme Leader goes home tonight and says, today I'm winning, uh, which, is, which, is a, which is a place, I think, a policy space in which we really need to think about where are the opportunities, where are the risks, especially in, in how he thinks about his nuclear uh, deterrent discussions. And I'm turning it over to Eric. Yeah, no, that, if I could just jump in on top of that. I mean, I, I fully agree with you, Dana. I mean, I think I, I would also draw sort of a distinction between two time periods. You know, I agree that um, from October 7th until whatever date you want to put on in April, I would argue that Iran probably saw its threshold strategy as successful, right? At that point, right? Iran, for all, all the reasons you laid out, probably saw itself as, as play, playing the crisis very well taking advantage of it, having some successes in, in their goals, and their deterrent was adequate, and they didn't need to change anything on the nuclear front. But I think after, at some point in April, that probably, if it hasn't shifted, I think there's at least increasing questions in the Supreme Leader's mind about the adequacy of that nuclear component uh, uh, of the deterrent. I think the challenge for Iran is that, yes, they can add additional advanced centrifuges, they can go to 90% tomorrow if they would like, but if all of the kind of the known estimates are correct, they are still a little ways out from actually having a missile, missile deliverable nuclear weapon, right? That's going to take longer. So what does the Supreme Leader do with that space, right? How does he manage that? Um, what does he actually believe is an adequate deterrent in that realm? And so I think time-wise, right, there's, there's, the, there's the question of how does this current conflict impact his decisions now? Does he go for a bomb now? Does he escalate to 90% now? Um, and then there's the longer term question of once all of this presumably ends, however it ends, how, how do, do his or his successors 
read the trajectory of this conflict and what it means for Iran's deterrent and its nuclear program. Um, and I think on that front, there's actually, well, on both fronts, the current crisis and history, you know, you look back and unfortunately, there's some worrying historical cases about how crises have shaped countries thinking on, on nuclear strategy, right? Whether it's, you know, Israel crossed the nuclear threshold in 1967, right? If most of the, the research on that is accurate. Iraq undertook a crash nuclear weapons program uh, soon after invading Kuwait in the context of the, the Gulf War and that crisis. Uh, in a crisis in 1990, Pakistan probably manufactured uh, uranium shells for a nuclear weapon in the context of that, right? So there's a, there's a lot of reasons to be worried about how this might play out over the long term. In the interim, while the leadership in Iran considers its options, both for its nuclear program as well as its conventional capabilities, which nuclear may probably could likely go quicker than conventional capabilities that become more of a deterrent in the region. They are, they have a at least semi-permissive environment to continue its campaign of instability in the region. And uh, that is an objective for them that is in their interest to maintain that instability. And, and so as long as that, that those conditions exist where they can con continue to harass, disrupt, um, both military, militarily and economically, that gives them the time to, to field new capabilities, to increase their, its military cooperation with Russia and China uh, in order to develop a, a, a force of the future that would be more of a deterrent. A few more considerations for how the Supreme Leader and his inner circle might look at how the table is set as the conflict in Gaza winds down at some point. First of all, what the Supreme Leader and Tehran wants is the U.S. military out of the Middle East. And what's happened since October 7th is pretty significant increases in defense posture. And in fact, it had to be a surprise to him to have two aircraft carriers in the region at the same time, which hasn't happened, I'm looking at Gavin, for a really long time. Long time. So number one, increase in U.S. military, not something in the Iranian interest. Number two is they would like Israel to be isolated. And after April 13th, Israel is not isolated. They want to drive a wedge between the United States and Israel. Not only is there not a wedge when it comes to Iran, but we just passed a multi-billion dollar supplemental on Tuesday of this week. So this is a signal that the United States is in it, in the Middle East, and backing Israel for the long term. And finally, in the middle of all of this, uh, uh, the Iranian state-on-state -state attack, Prime Minister of Iraq, Sudani, came to Washington. And he has been extensively involved in telling the Iranians, I don't want Iraq to be a battleground between the United States and Iran. Cut it out with the attacks on U.S. forces. I'm handling this. So all of those things are probably not making the supreme leader feel very comfortable, which again, I think, puts us in a very perilous and precarious situation as the conflict in Gaza winds down. Because other than Hamas, none of those other proxies are at risk of collapse right now. Their conventional capabilities were just found to be really wanting, which is, again, when I'm looking at Eric over here and how he thinks about his own nuclear program, I think we're entering a really fraught period. Let me ask you then what about the most fraught aspects of this? What are the risks that you're all most focused on? Now, I will start with you, Eric, because in your last comment, you were laying out a pretty ominous set of details if Iran's takeaway from all of this is that it should rush to actually build a bomb, what happens? The main risk is that if Iran were to take some sort of action, like move to 90%, right? Um, or, or just even setting aside the, the action that Iran takes, if something were to occur that were to cause the U.S. or Israel to strike Iran's nuclear program, right? I think then um, we enter a, a world of a lot of uncertainty, right? Could a strike temporarily disrupt or set back Iran's program? Probably. Is it going to be able to eliminate it entirely? No. And so what does Iran do after that, right? I think the safe bet is that Iran probably withdraws from the NPT, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, uh, kicks out international inspectors, and begins to rebuild its nuclear program uh, in a way that is harder to detect, more hidden. Um, and that probably makes the affirmative decision to go for nuclear weapons, right? And that is a very different challenge 
uh, than we're facing today. So that's a scenario I worry about. There's also a range of scenarios that you could foresee where there's you know miscalculation, right? I mean, Iran could see could be worried about an Israeli strike on its nuclear program for real or for you know completely you know made up reasons. And it takes some sort of step to try and protect its nuclear facility. Uh, and that causes the, the Israeli strike that it, that it feared, right? I would also highlight that in, in the most recent sort of exchange of, of fire between Israel and Iran, there was a period of time where the International Atomic Energy Agency could not visit or would not visit Iran's nuclear facilities, not because Iran was trying to keep them out, right? But because there was a safety concern, right? The, the, the IEA didn't feel comfortable going there. Well, there was a time where Iran specifically said, no, you can't come because we're worried about a strike. And then the IAEA took some additional time because it was concerned about the safety of its employees, right? And so that's not, you know, that's not Iran like manufacturing a, 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 a scenario so that it can break out. It's a real crisis that's having a real impact on monitoring. So you could foresee some of these other scenarios that lead to miscalculation uh, uh, that could end up in a strike or in, in Iran taking some, some pretty provocative nuclear steps. One of the things that I am concerned about is how long a 2.0 carrier presence is sustainable. And I don't think it's long enough just because of the, the wear and tear priorities of the, of the fleet elsewhere around the world. So a 2.0 carrier presence, it's been a long time since we were at that level in, in CENTCOM and in Fifth Fleet. Uh, I, I don't see it as being a sus sustainable deterrent. So we have to take that into consideration as we figure out where resources need to be allocated from the Defense Department. And I think we need to be um, refocusing on the idea of, of the United States military being a security integrator to points Dana was making earlier, rather than a security guarantor in the region. But there are, you know, that comes with a, a lot of dollars and that comes with a lot of arms deals that may not necessarily be palatable in the United States. Uh, it comes with a level of commitment to our partners in the region that we may have had, but has eroded over uh, the last period as well that we need to sort of reestablish before we can get back into the business of integrating regional security to deter Iran. I'll add two other concerns. The first is, I said earlier that we have seen the activation of Iran's proxy network across the region. I really worry that we actually have not seen the full activation of that proxy network. So if Hezbollah wants to turn it up, the Houthis want to turn it up, uh, Iraq and Syria-based militias want to turn up the heat, I think it could be a lot worse for the United States and for Israel and, frankly, for our partners in the region uh, that we really have uh, a deep interest in, in deepening cooperation with. And the other one that I really worry about is 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 not just the Iran Russia deepening cooperation but the more these guys are isolated diplomatically through sanctions uh with the supplemental if Russia perceives itself to be on its back foot and Iran perceives itself to be losing in the grand chess game of of Middle East and its regional ambitions they're both going to look to China uh, and North Korea. And we already see these senior leaders on a nice little cocktail circuit of visiting each other's capitals. What that looks like in the 21st century, technological exchange, military exchanges, ways to deepen cooperation to evade the potency of our sanctions, the different domains in which they could cooperate that represent a really serious existential challenge to what the United States is building with our allies and partners um, is, is, is something that I really, really worry about. The more isolated each of these capitals are, the deeper they cooperate with each other. And that uh, opposing access really could threaten the security of the United States and our partners. And can I add one point to what Dana said, which, I mean, I think that the, you made the point about how Iran hasn't fully activated its proxy network yet and what that could, what that could look like. And I, I share that concern, and I do worry that if that world comes about, right, then you're really quickly approximating, you know, the nightmare vision of what everyone thought it would look like if there was a strike on Iran's nuclear program and Iran decided to activate that network and, in response. And so how does the, 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 our being in that world change the incentives both in Tehran about maybe going further on the nuclear program and then both in Jerusalem about whether or not, okay, I'm already in this conflict, Iran's already bringing its worse, why not strike now on the nuclear program? And so I worry about that too. 
So final question then, you've all collectively laid out uh, a series of somewhat troubling paradoxes. The more effectively America isolates its foes, the more effectively they're going to cooperate with each other. The more effectively America degrades the axis of resistance, the more incentive Tehran will have to turn to a nuclear deterrent. What does Washington actually do? Global priorities continue to require us to find more effective ways to reduce our military footprint in the region. I think that that comes, in order to do that successfully, we need to reestablish trust with some of our key allies and partners in the region, uh, and we need to equip them accordingly so that they can become interoperable with each other uh, while we continue our diplomatic efforts to really build trust amongst themselves, not just bilaterally with the United States, but amongst themselves to form, you know, kind of the, the, the ideal partner force that is capable of projecting a sufficient deterrent to force Tehran to recalculate, to reconsider um, consequences of taking steps either towards its nuclear deterrent or in deepening its relationships uh, with Russia and China. I think we need to recognize a couple of realities, right, as we think through options. One is the reality that Iran's program, its nuclear program, is now so far advanced that you're never going to be able to roll it back and put it into the JCPOA box again, right? There's just certain advances they've made, uh, certain knowledge they've gained that cannot be unwound. Uh, And so what does that mean for future deals? I think the other reality is that the geopolitics, again, are completely different now than they were when the JCPOA was, was finalized, right? Russia and China are not helpful <laughs> uh, like they were during the uh, during the negotiations of the JCPOA. They're actively aiding Iran uh, in a lot of ways. They are uh, undercutting international efforts at the IEA's Board of Governors to put pressure on Iran. And so there's really no P5 plus one anymore. And so I, I think as we grapple with those realities, I, th- I think we need to think about what that means for a potential nuclear deal moving forward, right? And what shape that could possibly take uh, and I think we've got to be we flexible and be open on that. I would say I'll try and conclude perhaps on a positive note here. Again, the, the one thing that we have going for us is that as far as we know, Iran is not actively working to build nuclear weapons, right? So it's got a lot of advances on, on the fuel cycle side, but it still has more work to do uh, towards, towards weaponization. And that, to me, suggests the Supreme Leader views that either as unnecessary or too risky or both. Let's try and keep it that way. Right. That should be our goal. Let's try and keep it that way. So after the April 13th Iranian attack on Israel, we are in a diplomatic moment. So we have an opportunity. President Biden was able to gather the other leaders of the G7 and talk about Iranian aggression. Then Secretary of State Blinken went to Capri, Italy, not just for the beautiful Italian vista, but again, to really talk about where we converge with the G7 on stabilizing the Middle East. Um, The UN Security Council convened and also discussed it. So we have some opportunities here to coordinate amongst ourselves. Number two is the way we lose that diplomatic moment is probably if the Gaza conflict and campaign goes on in such a way that our partners in the Middle East, specifically in Europe, feel um, that they can't cooperate with us. So we have an interest in both working with Israel to to wind down the conflict in Gaza in such a way that Hamas can not reconstitute and reassert governance over, over Gaza. Number two, we also need to be working with the Ukrainians on how to wind that down. And of course, in classic uh, foreign policy, as we seek to isolate and, and target the bad behaviors of either Moscow or Tehran, there have to be off ramps. At the same time, some of this is is the opportunities that that we have not only with diplomacy, but through normalization, which is why the White House has continued to talk to leaders in Riyadh about the possibility of a mutual defense treaty between the United States and Israel and normalization between Riyadh and Jerusalem. We've continued to talk about integration. We've continued to work with the Abraham Accords countries. And then, of course, on the military side, There is a demonstrated proof of concept now that integration of of capabilities actually works. So we need to be doubling down on both the defense diplomacy and the hard investments and infrastructure to continue that work. And here again, 
I can't underscore enough the importance of that supplemental. It was not just for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. It actually has a significant investment in our own defense industry expansion, which means that we can do better for our allies and partners across the Middle East, across Asia, and across Europe, and getting more rapidly and predictably to them the capabilities they need to cooperate with us in an integrated manner. Any final thoughts before we wrap up here? I just need to issue the standard disclaimer that I am here uh, expressing my own personal opinions, which do not reflect those of the Department of Defense, Department of the Navy, or the U.S. government. Anything else? Thanks so much for having me. Thank you all for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the War on the Rocks podcast. Please don't forget to check out our membership program at www.waronTheRocks.com backslash membership. You'll get Mike Kaufman talking about the war in Ukraine, You'll get Ankit Panda talking about nuclear war and much, much else. 